grab your Bible, open it to Proverbs. We have Dr. Dave, he's in the house. He really is here physically. How was the how was the trip over across the Skyway Bridge? It was wonderful today because I left so much earlier. I didn't hit any traffic, and I got here real quick, so it was nice. When you pick, choose, determine where you're going to go on vacation, where would that be? You know, I thought you were going to say when you pick, choose, and determine what shirt you're going to wear on this show. How do you do it? Because I thought you were going to say something about this shirt. <laughs> no, no. Uh, on no, vacation? I, no, I leave your dressing alone. <laughs> Generally speaking. By the way, your, po your pocket is not buttoned. Yeah, I have very valuable things in here I might need to access during the program. <laughs> okay. But um, right. when I, uh, vacations are determined pretty much by where Colleen wants to go. You just ask her to pick a place and we'll go there. So, so basically everything you do is to appease Colleen? No, I'm not saying that, Colleen. Uh, I'm just saying when it comes to vacation time. Did you make that comment to appease Colleen? It's just, it's just, it's just easier and smoother to let the wife choose where we go and we go there. Because I'm, I'm happy going anywhere. It'd be fine to wherever we go. Are you in charge of your home? Would you say you are the, the captain of your ship? But you know, sometimes the Lord speaks to me. <laughs> And I think he's telling me we need to get right into Proverbs 26 here and, 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 and look at question number four through five about answering a fool <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> according to his folly. Whoa, I don't want to get, I don't want to get guilty of that. Yeah, so. You can't tell I'm his father-in-law, can you? No, no. You can't now, I'm not that. calling you a fool. I'm saying they're, they're telling you oh, don't. See, there's certain things you shouldn't say. See, I, I determined that I was the brunt of that comment. Well, as, as long as you, that, does that, as does long that, as it gets the attention off Colleen, I'm fine <laughs> yeah, with it. That's right. Move along. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, verse two of chapter 26 reads this way: Like a flitting sparrow, we were just talking about this before the show began. Like a flying swallow, so a curse without cause shall not alight. Now, this is an important verse for practical interactions and for those who are a little superstitious about the occult. But a flitting sparrow and a flying swallow are two different allusions to birds that never seem to really be hanging somewhere for long. Sparrows are always landing, looking yeah. around nervously, and they fly off. Swallows are always seem to be flying somewhere. You know, other kind of birds, hawks and eagles, and they, they seem to light on a lamppost and look down, and crows will sit and stare. But swallows and sparrows tend to just always be going somewhere. He said a that is similar to a curse without a cause. And so what he's telling the young men is, don't do things that are going to give people a legitimate reason to bring hardship into your life. If you don't give them cause, it will not light on you. Trouble seems to go to those who cause trouble, which is why so many people who seem to have trouble in their lives a lot, they don't often recognize that they're the stimulus for a lot of those problems. You've counseled a lot of people in your lifetime. For How many years pastor it? Forty. Forty. Uh, and you've probably sat in front of somebody that just has, I don't know why trouble seems to follow me. And you probably, when you're looking at the person, the person saying that, you know pretty well the personality of this individual. So how do, you, how do you break into somebody and say, you know what, you are the problem. It's not the people you think that are, you, you just can't get along with or whatever, or they pay no attention to what you're saying to them and they never care about what you're saying. That's not the problem. You're the, how, do you, how do you get to that? Well, you know, that's, that's a, a good segue into the next verse we're gonna look at, but I'll answer that before we get there. And that is, in some way, all of us have trouble coming into our lives because of the choices that we've made. We made well-intended choices. We made choices that were uninformed. We made choices that were good choices, but they were the best choice out of four that none of them were gonna produce a good result. The troubles that come into our life, instead of thinking that things just always happen to us, we have to remind ourselves most of what occurs in our life is some type of result of choices that we have made that have put us in a situation to be where we are when that trouble happens. 
there are other times when trouble comes into our life directed by the hand of God for chastening purposes, for strengthening purposes, for wisdom purposes. There are some troubles that come into our life because of the evil intent of Satan, his minions, or just evil intended people. But an awful lot of times the troubles are self-inflicted because of the choices that we made a month ago, a year ago, a lifetime ago, whatever it might be. So the question, answer to your question is, I won't, I won't say that to somebody if I don't perceive in them the openness to hearing a rebuke. And one of the reasons is because of this next verse. So basically the person is there probably because they can't accept rebuke. Well, it, usually in a counseling situation, when someone's griping about all the bad things that always happen to them, they are not considering the six or seven things they did that provoked that thing. Uh, oftentimes when somebody, uh, even when they, and when they sin, and their sin brings an open rebuke, they are bothered by the open rebuke much more so than by the sin well, that brought the rebuke. That's a good example. Good, you're right. Because, and, yeah. and we all have that yeah. tendency. Oh, yeah. Everybody. But in a counseling scenario, people who are uh, repetitive in counseling, they tend to follow that cycle continually. They make bad choices because they want to make that choice, and then they are upset by the result. And of if that you choice. rebuke them, then they would probably come back and say, "I expected you to say something like that about me." Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm always the fault, or you sound like my wife, or whatever. And I don't hesitate to tell somebody something they need to hear if I believe they can receive it. And it goes to verse four and five: Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. So these are two contradictory exhortations. Don't answer a fool, answer a fool. Don't answer a fool according to his folly, answer a fool according to his folly. So what is, is that a contradictory? Is it a, is it a confused mind of Solomon or is there a truth there? Well, we have to assume there's a powerful truth. So the way I interpret that passage to mean, don't answer a fool, in the same manner as his folly. In other words, don't become like him in your answer to him. Because he's agitated, you don't get agitated. Because he's aggressive, don't be aggressive. Because he's defensive, don't you be defensive. Don't answer a fool in the same manner as the folly that he's wrapped up That's in. That's wisdom. Lest you be like him. Uh, but answer a fool according to his folly means address the folly lest he is wise in his own eyes. In other words, he's, he remains a fool. Bring truth to bear into his life so that he can be out of that blindness. But there's a fine line between casting your pearl before swine, beating your head up against a wall, or trying to give counsel to somebody who will not receive it. If you had to give a percentage of all the people you have counseled, percentage-wise, what percent would you say they followed it? They did it. It resulted in great things for them. I'd say high percentage immediately, and then as time goes on, the percentage drops. So people often say, that's wonderful, that's good. How did you know that? And how, That's wonderful advice, and they'll apply it, and things are great. But within two weeks, old patterns reemerge. So I'd say, because uh, I try to give biblical sound counsel that has that ring of truth, when somebody hears it, they pretty much know you know, that's right. But it comes back to the, the patterns of behavior we develop over years is often stronger than that one moment of illumination. Yeah. So we, we end up doing the same thing even though we know it's not right. Self-control is a big part of our life, isn't it? Yes. And, and if we get that far in this chapter, it's actually the last verse we're going to look at, how powerful that is. Self-control determines a lot of things that we don't understand because what it keeps you from not doing, yeah. uh, you know, and what it, and, and the things that it prevents you from getting involved in. I, I have, I have worked on that all my life and I've, you know, of course, you know, I'm 80 now, so, so and, and what, what, what I do on my knees many times, I say, Lord, I would think at my age, I wouldn't still be working on what I was working on at 20, but you are. Yes, and, and if you've conquered whatever you, or um, struggling with at 20, something at 30 came up brand new, you're struggling with yeah, that. Yeah. The struggles never end yeah. because we are, we are flawed, we are finite in our understanding, 
we are limited in our character because we have this living spirit within us that's been enlivened to God, but it doesn't kill the flesh. The flesh is still alive. So that's why Paul says, crucify the yeah. flesh, die daily, because every single day that flesh yeah. resurrects. I was watching a guy last night on, on Christian television, it was, uh, was Daystar, I think it was. And maybe, maybe it was CTN, because the same guy's on both, both networks. And he said, uh, you don't have to confess your sin anymore. That is not necessary. Christ died on Calvary for all of your sin, every sin you'll ever commit. So he said, you don't have to do that anymore. They're already, go they're, they're, they're forgiven. Stop confessing. Yeah. What do you think? Well, that's true in one extent, and it's not true in the other. It's true in the sense that you don't have to ask for forgiveness to repair your relationship with God. You ask for forgiveness to repair your fellowship with God. So the first confession of, Lord, save me, is to establish that relationship where you are born again. That relationship is permanent. Nothing, no sin you commit is going to affect that. What's affected is your fellowship with God. We often flip those two words and think Very they're the true. same thing, but they're Very not. True. A relationship is by birth. Fellowship is how you get along with a person. So we confess our sin to remain in good fellowship with God, not to try to get saved again and again and again and again, because you get saved once. You get born once. But in the family, you drift from the Father because of sin. So I would say it's both the true and a false statement that yeah. the man made, it's yeah. based that, upon the context. It would been great if you were sitting next to him explaining that, because I think there was a lot of misunderstanding what he just, what he left out there. Yeah, he was trying to give credence, yeah. and I don't know who he is, but I'm assuming he's trying to say, this is the power of God's yeah. grace. This yeah. is the yeah. extent of his forgiveness. Yeah. You're free, and that's true when it comes to salvation, yeah. but it's not true with fellowship yeah. with God. Yeah. Uh, verse 7. Well, a good example, by the way. You get married to Sharon, all right? You got married her, I don't know how many years ago? Sixty years, Six years in ago. May. All right, you got married once, but your fellowship with her has to be renewed every day. Oh, you got that right. So you don't go, you don't go to the preacher every other day and get married again. <laughs> you just keep the fellowship. It's the same thing with salvation. Well, wouldn't you think if you're looking at 60 married as, a, as the anniversary coming up, that you would get along every day? I mean, you wouldn't have any conflict. Wouldn't you think that? It, it'd be nice, in, you know, but that's not the real world. <laughs> yeah, the real world is two flawed people leaning together, only get along because they're uh, also Actually, she God. married a flawed person. I married Mother Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> if, if Mother Teresa was a good cook. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Verse 7, like the legs of the lame that hang limp is a proverb in the mouth of fools. And that simply men, means that wisdom uh, in, in the mouth of a foolish person is a waste of time. It's useless. If you've ever fallen asleep at night and had your arm in a weird place and then your arm is yeah, numb and yeah. it flops or around you, yeah. and you can't use it. It happens to my leg. That's why, that's why the Bible says don't waste your time giving wisdom to fools. And by fool, remember, it doesn't mean somebody's not intellectual or not smart. It means somebody who is not in allegiance to the God of knowledge. Their devotion is not to truth. It's to self. That's a fool. If, if they're not open to truth, don't waste your time giving them the proverb because they'll just misuse it. Uh, and, and it's as good as a lame man with a lame leg. They, they'll, they, and they'll cherry pick. That's, that's what people read the Word of God. They cherry pick. Yes. And they make a whole lesson out of a phrase in the Word of God. And when you hear them doing it, you go, no, that's, <laughs> that is not what that meant. And it's a good warning to all of us as Bible students, which I think every Christian should be as a Bible student, be careful that we don't read our prejudices and our preferences and our ambitions into Scripture. Good point. Let the Scripture speak to us because it's very easy to, in our human mind, and inst instantaneously to see our desire encoded in Scripture. It's far better to, to it's called exegesis, Ad, not, not J-E-S-U-S, -S, but G-E-S-I-S. -S. Exegesis means let the, let the truth come out of Scripture into you. Don't put truth into Scripture. Say that again, Dave. That, that is so profound. It really is. Exegesis. Exegesis as opposed to eisegesis. Yes. It's, a, it's a hermeneutical term. Right. That you, you read into the Scripture rather than having the Scripture read out to you. But for each one of us, we take our desires, our culture, even our traditions, our, our Christian culture, and we take that and we, we look to find it in Scripture and we put it in there. 
and we can make things say things that the Bible doesn't really intend by taking it out of context. Instead, to keep it within the context of what's being said and let it speak to us. It's far better for us to learn from God's Word rather than for us to teach God's Word, to try to change it. But we all, you know, it's like the... And you have, you have to be... You have to be in a spiritual setting to do what you just said, to be able to receive off of these pages into me so that I can impart it to that audience. Yeah, and I That's think tough. The, the, and the spirituality begins with humility. To assume when you open this book, I don't know all that I'm supposed to know. I don't understand everything. I want to learn from this great book of wisdom. Lord, open my heart and mind to learn what you want me to know from this not go looking for things to prove what you believe to be right. Yeah. Because that, you're, you're going to find it. If you want to prove what you believe to be right, you'll find it in here. But if you want to find out what the Bible says, you might find out some of the things you believe aren't necessarily true. Yeah. And, and it will liberate you from it's, your prejudice. It's amazing how truth will change your theology <laughs> yeah, many yeah, times. Yes. I mean, literally. Reading the Word of God and finding the truth. Right. And sometimes really good Bible study will ruin really good preaching. <laughs> Boy, that is, yeah. Oh, that's wisdom. Continue. Um, verse uh, 10. The great God who formed everything gives the fool his hire and the transgressor his wages. And this is a reminder to these men who are going to be in a position of authority, these young guys who are being discipled or being trained by Solomon, who are going to be judges and, and princes and rulers, let God take care of those who do wrong. Oh, that is so good. God will, yeah. God will yeah. vindicate yeah. His way yeah. and, and He will pay them what's coming to them, either at the judgment seat of Christ for the believer, yeah. where we finally find out if our works were valid or not, or the great white throne judgment when everybody's going to receive the result of their sin who don't believe in Jesus Christ. But God who made everything, He didn't overlook the yeah. fact the creatures he made are accountable to him. He's yeah. going to hold everybody accountable. It, it, it's like you get letters, and we get, we get letters, obviously, you do, you, when you're on television. You get a lot of people that have an opinion. But the, the, you get a lot of mail that wants to, stra want to straighten you out yes. in something you've said. Yes. I mean, it's like they are chosen by God to do this. And it's probably their personality for everybody they're around. Yes, and, and I ought to say, if it's a one-time person, I'll always read it. Absolutely. If it's the same person continually, I, I no longer yeah. listen because yeah. um, they have an agenda. But if it's somebody who sometimes they actually present it in a, it's a valid point, yeah. and I know they're being sincere and genuine, but something has made them believe what they believe. So I'll look to see, well, did what I say, was it incorrect? So I'll always check uh, if I think the, the expression is genuine and not that's just a, that's so a much good, That's a good analogy. Uh, verse 11, as a dog returns to his own vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. And we've, I, I've ever seen that, but I have seen dogs eat their vomit. It's a disgusting thing yeah. to watch. You, yeah. you, you, it's it blows genetic. your mind. You think, how possibly could that dog think that is a good thing? It's a God-given It's a God-given action. But, uh, you know, you know, but you know I've, I, when I, because I, I was raised you know, a lot of my life in Armenian churches, uh, you know, where you, yeah. you're saved and you lose it, and you're saved and you lose it, you know, they, they you know, they, they sang, you must be born again a hundred times. Right. And so, <laughs> so, and they would use this the, as a example, you know, losing your salvation, that you go back to, the, to just like the, the, the dog returns to his vomit. In other words, you, you were saved and you turn, returned to sin again. Yeah, and, and that's a, one of those times where a verse is taken out of context. This is not a verse about salvation. This is a, ver, a verse about behavioral character. So just like a dog is completely unaware that that vomit is nasty, they are unaware of it. Therefore, they will eat it back up. A fool is unaware of the flaws in his behavior, so he repeats it. It's, it's a lack of awareness of what truth is, a lack of awareness of what virtue is, and a fool, again, is not a non-intellectual person. Does that, obviously, I answer my own question, the, the person that has that flaw, will they ever get past that flaw and realize, you know what, I'm doing this? Only with a radical change because of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. 
uh, because a, a, a fool, by definition, is somebody who is rejecting truth for their own truth. And until they let go of their own truth, which means I'm right in my own eyes and my ways are the best yeah, ways yeah. And, and I'm wise in my own eyes. Until they let go of that, they can't embrace the greater truth that there's a God who has said what is right or wrong and you're to comply with that. Until you give that up, you can't embrace this. Have you ever had a Christian born again? I mean, you wouldn't know, I mean, but you, 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 you know this guy is saved. At least you, you, you know what had happened and he gave testimony. And he said to you, about something that somebody did to him, I will never forgive that person. Yes, I've heard it many times. How does that, because if, if we don't forgive, you just said he doesn't forgive. Right. Well, I, I would, when that happens. Is, is the person really meaning that or are they just making a, a verbiage? Sometimes they mean it, that they're, they're saying I, am, I intend to hold this against this person till the day they die. I will not forgive. Yeah, some people mean it as, I'm hurting so bad, I'll never get over this hurt. So you have to know the context of what they're saying. And some people are saying, I just simply can't imagine uh, of this thing not being paramount in my mind the rest of my life, this was so bad. It's an expression of, of angst. Depending on what their real intent for saying that is, is how you would approach it. But if somebody's telling me, I'm making a decision to never forgive this person, then I would lovingly say, I understand why you feel that way, but what you're saying is you are never going to be free of the bondage that offense is going to keep you in. Would you ever say you can't be saved by n not forgiving? Because if you won't forgive, neither will your Heavenly Father forgive you? No, because that forgiveness is related to fellowship, not relationship. If the person is born again, and they don't forgive people, their fellowship with God is what is being severed, is what is being hindered, not their salvation. If they're not saved and they're not going to forgive anybody, that hardens their heart to their own need and, for and salvation. At that point, they're saying that if that person gets saved and is in heaven, I wouldn't want to go to heaven. Yeah, that they could hate that badly. Yeah. And because bitterness and resentment hardens your heart yeah. and it keeps you from seeing your own sin and therefore you become a victim entitled to everything rather than an, an infractor yourself who needs grace. You, you no longer see yourself that way. That's what bitterness and resentment does, which is why I think Satan, one of his greatest tools in destroying people's lives is to have some great offense happen to them where they now categorize themselves as an offender who needs justice rather than a sinner who needs mercy. Is unforgiving to somebody the prerequisite of bitterness? Um, it leads to it because bitterness is, is an entrenched lack of forgiveness. Uh, a, an, un, an unforgiving spirit might be the initial reaction somebody has, then the Lord checks them, the Holy Spirit grieves them and they realize, I need to let that go. But a held on unforgiveness turns into resentment and bitterness, which is a long standing viewpoint of the other person that I'm going to hold you accountable and I'm going to punish you by my bad attitude towards wow, you. Wow. And, but all you really do is punish yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, bitterness yeah. and resentment, yeah. some people have said, is you taking poison hoping the other person is going to die. Good example. It, it just it, is counterproductive. Uh, this is a verse we've actually talked about many times, the, the principle. Verse 12, do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. So although we've been told a fool is a man who's wise in his own eyes, <laughs> He said, if you see a man like that, and you got another fool over here who's the same way, there's more hope for that guy than there is for this person. In other words, there's no hope. It's to, ha to be wise in your own eyes means you are unable to perceive or receive the truth and wisdom coming from other people. Wow. Because you're, you're so sure you're oh, right. Boy, it's good stuff. Verse 17, he who passes by and meddles in a quarrel not his own, is like one who takes a dog by the ears. One of the most vivid um, metaphors this in is, Proverbs. This is so good. If you can imagine, not, not like a, a dachshund yeah. or a chihuahua. Yeah. Imagine yeah. a pit bull yeah. or a, a rottweiler you're grabbing by the ears or a, a half wolf, yeah. you know, husky <laughs> grabbing well, just, him by the ears. Just stick with a pit bull. Yeah. That's all you need. That, that's the imagery. If you go around looking for, uh, to get involved in issues that aren't yours, yeah. You might as well just grab a mad dog by the ears and let oh, him you, Oh, you pieces. think you heard something, you walk up next to somebody and go, uh, uh, giving your opinion? Yeah. And, and the person standing there like, 
they don't even know what we're talking about. Right. And I don't know if we've got it to it yet. I forget where we are in, in Proverbs, but the Bible says, he that answers a matter before he hears it, it's a folly and a shame to him. So when you get engaged in, in a dispute between two people, there's no way you can know both people's side of the story True. completely. You will know 170%, 130, or yeah. 110, 190. Don't get involved. Don't get in between the two Boy. because you're, you're going to bring folly and shame yeah. into your own life. You'll make a determination only for time to show you that you were wrong. And then you get upset at the person turning to you and go, you, this is not your business. So you're upset at that person and you interjected yourself and you deserve what you got from that person. Yes, yes. And they may have just saved you some time by <laughs> casting you out of the debate yeah. so you don't stay in. Yeah. But uh, also it's taking up other people's offenses, which is a very powerful truth for church members to know. When a church member has a grievance against the pastor, or a pastor has a grievance against a church member, or a church member against another, yeah. and that person there is your friend, don't take up their grievance. Yet loyalty does not mean that you fight the fights of your friends. It means you love and support and accept them even when they're wrong. But don't take other people's offenses to be yours. There's one person who could do that. There was one person who took all the offenses of Amen. mankind Amen. and made it his. Amen. The Bible says the Lord Jesus not only took our sin and bore our sin, He became our sin yeah. on the cross. And He did that so that the penalty of our sin could be removed forever so that we could have fellowship and a relationship with God. Our sin has been dealt with on the cross completely and wholly in terms of us being born again, having, having the title or the deed or the citizenship of heaven, having our name written down in the book of life. Once that's done, though, it's important for you and I to have a humble heart, a repentant heart, that we might stay in close fellowship with God. That's why John said, without repentance, there is no uh, way to be born again. There is no reconciliation with God. Repentance is essential, whether you're a believer or not. But the wonderful grace of God is that He loves us. He understands us. He knows us. He designed us. He forgives us completely. And then His Spirit sustains us in fellowship with Him by indwelling us and sealing us, guiding us all through the truth and the power revealed in His Word. If you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, I implore you today to respond to the gospel by saying, Lord Jesus, I believe you are my Savior. If you are a Christian, just renew that fellowship every single day. How blessed we are that you can trust Christ today in the freedom and the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you. Bye-bye.